Okay, here is a classical mechanics problem for you that I, I've actually seen this problem come up, um, but I, the solution's not really clear to me. Uh, maybe there's some trick, but I'm going to do it numerically, but still, I think it's a good problem. Um, so let me describe the problem. So you have like a circular curved path, which I drew poorly here, but it's still circular, it's supposed to be, with a block sliding down it. Now, that's, n that's a good problem of its own. But this one has friction. So there's a frictional force between the block and the plane. So let me just draw the forces on this. We'll talk about polar coordinates and the acceleration. I'm going to talk about this in just a second, and then we'll get right to work. Um, so what forces are acting on this block? Well, there's downward gravitational force, mg. And then there's a frictional force, which is friction is uh, parallel to the surface and in the opposite direction of the sliding for kinetic friction. So in that case, it would be this way at this instant. And I'll call that FF. Now, you can see right here, there's two problems with this friction force. Number one, the direction is not constant. Because up here, the friction force is straight up. Here, the friction force is horizontal. And number two, it depends on the normal force, which is this way. And so as the block slides down and it is increases in speed, uh, it's going to move in a circle, and so this normal force is going to increase in magnitude too. So the frictional force is going to depend on both the position because of the angle, uh, and that also depends on the normal force, and the speed. So it's, it's not trivial. Okay. Now, I mean, I, honestly, if you take away friction, I don't think that's a trivial problem. It looks like the same as the problem for a pendulum, but once you start with large angles, it's you got to do some tricks to solve that thing. So, but the one thing that is going on here that's really nice is that the block stays a constant distance from this point up here uh, because it's moving in a circle. And that, that distance, the radius of the circle, I'm using capital R. So if I use polar coordinates uh, to represent the motion of this, then I have its position in two dimensions as some r, lowercase r, the distance from the origin, and the angle theta, then uh, one of those variables, r, is constant. So I'll end up with just one variable theta. And so that's kind of nice. Now, the problem is that if I have this as r hat and this, let me draw it. My drawing is not so great right now, theta hat. Then as this thing moves, r hat and theta hat are not constant. So when you start taking derivatives of position vectors with respect to time, uh, theta hat and r hat also change with time. And then the second derivative changes with the time too. So that's a whole another problem. And I have a solution to that. I have a video on that. I'll post it down below unless I forget. And then I'm not going to post it. But I'll try to remember to do that. And if you do that, if you take the second derivative of the r vector, which is, remember, r vector is this from here to there, which is just r, r hat. Um, if you take the second derivative, you have to take the derivative of r hat, and then you get this theta hat term in there, and then you got to take the derivatives again. But you get this as the expression for <clears throat> the derivative in polar coordinates uh, with r hat and theta hat. Now, we actually have a really nice thing here in that r equals r. So these dots, just if you haven't seen that before, uh, one dot, r dot means r dot is dr dt. And that's not the vector, right? That's the r value in polar coordinates. So r double dot's the second derivative, just so you see that. So if r is r, okay, then r dot is 0, r double dot is 0. So that makes this a lot easier, right? So my derivative actually becomes uh, r big r theta dot squared, and the only term over here is r theta double dot. <clears throat> okay, so let's get to it. Let's use Newton's second law. I'm going to say f net r equals m the acceleration r direction, which is going to be equal to, this is the r direction. So that's going to be r theta dot squared. And if you want to think about this without doing this, you can say, okay, it's moving in a circle. This is the centripetal acceleration, m omega squared, r omega squared, right? <clears throat> that's the acceleration in the radial direction. So what forces are in the r direction? Well, I have this one right here, a component of the gravitational force. If that's theta, this is also theta, right? Because if I move this all the way up here, theta would be zero. So the component in the r direction is the opposite side. So it's going to be plus mg sine theta. 
And so this is the positive R direction. Okay. And then I have <clears throat> the normal force, so it's going to be minus N. So that's my expression for my Newton's second law in the R direction. Now let's go ahead and solve this for N. We're going to need that anyway. It's not too hard. I'm just going to add N to the other side, and I get Mg sine theta. Just double check in here because I made a mistake before. Minus M R theta dot squared. Now let's do F net in the theta direction. Okay, so what forces do I have in the theta direction? I have a component of the gravitational force, which is going to be this side right here, even in my poor drawing, which is mg cosine theta. And that's in the positive theta direction. M, that's the, the direction of increasing theta, the way I drew my picture. mg cosine theta. And then I have the frictional force, so I'm just going to put minus ff. It's in the theta. That's the other nice thing, right? In this, not only do I have the r values constant, but n is always in the opposite r direction. F is always in the theta hat direction, or the opposite theta hat direction. Okay, so that's going to be equal to mass times acceleration in the theta direction, which is going to be 2 r dot, which is 0. So I just get r m r theta double dot, which is the second derivative of theta. <clears throat> I want to solve this for theta double dot. So let's just go ahead and divide both sides by m r, and I get, and I'm going to also use f f equals mu n. That's my frictional force. And I'm not, I'm not going to put mu k because I'm lazy and we don't need it. So it's just going to be mu. So that's my frictional force. I can put that in over here and I get theta double dot equals uh, I'm divided by m r. So I get g over r cosine theta minus, now I'm going to put here mu n. So I get mu n over m r equals theta, oh, I already got the theta double dot. Well, it's still equal to theta double dot, double dot. Okay, now I'm going to substitute in my uh, n right here. I'm running out of room. So let's do it like this. So I'm going to get theta double dot equals g over r cosine theta minus, now I have mu over m r and multiplied by this. Let's just write it out. Mu over m r times mg sine theta minus m r theta dot squared. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm going to multiply this out. I get theta double dot g over r cosine theta minus, now right here I get mu g over r sine theta. And then if I do this one over here, the mr cancels, and I just get minus mu theta dot squared. So that's my expression for theta double dot. It's a differential equation, and maybe you can solve this. I don't really want to solve it, okay? Uh, let me just check. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. So what we're going to do is to do a numerical solution. So let's say that I break this into time steps of, let's say, delta t equals 0 0.001 seconds. During that time, a short time, a very short time interval, I can assume theta double dot is constant. It's not constant because it changes with theta and it changes with theta dot, right? So but let's say, assume that it is. And let's assume that I start off with theta 1 equals 0 and theta 1 dot equals 0. So I'm, this is in radians, radians per second. Um, I know the, the initial conditions. Can I find theta, one, theta 2 at the end of the time interval and theta dot 2 at the end of the time interval? Yes, I can. So let's start off with this. If, if I assume this is constant, I can say theta double dot is delta theta dot over delta t. That's a... Ch that's, that's how we define acceleration, change in velocity with respect to time, if it's constant. So that's going to be theta 2 dot minus theta 1 dot over delta t. That's the change in theta. So I know theta 1 dot is 0. So I can solve this for theta 2 dot. Theta 2 dot is going to be equal to theta 1 dot plus theta double dot 
delta t. That's important. So what I'm, I'm doing, I'm going to start off at the beginning. I can solve for theta double dot because I know all these values, and I can get theta 2 dot at the end of the time interval. Now I can use that velocity and say theta 2 dot, assume it's constant, which is totally not, is delta theta over delta t. And that's going to be equal to theta 2 minus theta 1 over delta t. I know theta 1. I can solve for theta 2. Theta 2 equals theta 1 plus theta 2 dot delta t. That's important. So I have three steps here. Number one, solve for theta double dot. Number two, use that to find the new theta t dot. And then number three, use that to find the new theta. That's at the end of 0.01 seconds. So if I want to do the next time interval, I just go back up here and recalculate theta double dot, since theta dot changed and, and theta changed, and then re-update the thetas. <clears throat> so you can see if I want to get a whole second of data here, I'm going to need to do a thousand of these. I don't want to do that. Do you want to do that? No one wants to do that. So that means that we can do this in Python, and I'm going to show you how to do this in Python. So now in Python, we do need a couple of important things. I need to pick a coefficient. Let's put, say, mu k equals 0 0.1. I need a mass. I don't actually need a mass. 100, it's, it's, a, it's a person sliding down. That's kind of high, but that's fine. 100 kilograms, whatever. Uh, R is 3 meters. Um, and then I, I need you have to have initial conditions. I need these in order to use this method. Okay. Okay, let's jump over to Python and make this happen. Okay, so here I am in Python. Hold one second. That makes my head too shiny. And it bothers me. If it bothers me, it might bother you. Okay, so here we are. We're going to start off with, um, let's go ahead and make, we're going to make a graph. I'm going to make a graph of a trajectory graph, uh, position versus time, which I will need to calculate uh, the position um, in Cartesian coordinates. But let's just make the graph G1 equals graph. If you need help with graphing, let me know. I have tons of tutorials on that. Uh, X title equals X in meters. Uh, y title equals title equals Y in meters. And let's put a width. I'm going to, it's a trajectory plot, so I'm going to say uh, width equals 400, height equals 400. No, 400. Okay, now I need a graph. F1 equals G curve, color equals color dot blue. Now, I'm going to make a trajectory plot in real time so that we can see it move. Uh, now, I'm not going to make a 3D animation, although you could. So I'm going to say uh, dot equals true. Now they'll leave a dot on the graph. Now let's put all my constants. R equals 3. G equals 9.8. Notice I'm using G as the scalar value. I'm not using the vector G. Uh, M equals 100. I don't need that. Mu equals 0 0.1. Um, theta equals 0. Theta dot equals 0. Um, T equals 0. DT equals 0 0.001. Okay, so now I, I'm going to do my I'm going to do my series of calculations in a loop. So I can move this up. I don't need all that. So I'm going to say while theta is less than pi over two. So that means I'm going to start up here at theta equals zero. Remember, my, I measure my theta from the x-axis on the negative side, and it's going to go down. So once it's directly at the bottom, I'm going to stop it. So rate in Python, in WebVPython, says um, don't do more than 1,000 loops per second. So this will make it run in real time since my time step is uh, 1 1,000th, which is fine. You can change that. So the first thing I'm going to do is to calculate theta double dot. So I'm going to say theta d dot. I see there's two d's in there. There's one d there. Maybe that's a bad way to write it. That's the way I always do it. Uh, this is going to be equal to g over r. I'm just looking at my equation that I typed. Cosine theta minus mu times g over r 
times sine theta minus mu times theta dot squared. That's theta double dot. Now, once I do that, next step is to update theta dot. Theta dot equals theta dot plus theta double dot times dt, just like I said over there. Now, the one thing I always like to point out is this is not an algebraic equal sign. This is a make equal to. So it's whatever the theta dot value is, add theta double dot times dt and make that the new one. So I can update the variable. I don't have to have a thousand different variables to do this problem. And same thing for theta. Theta equals theta plus theta dot times dt. And then finally, I can update time. t equals t plus dt. So I want to plot x and y, but I need to calculate, I need to transfer back into the Cartesian coordinate system. So I can say x equals negative r times cosine theta. So if you look back at the picture, if where, where theta is measured, if I want to find the x position, it's, it's the cosine of that angle. Look at the picture. I don't want to switch back. And then uh, r, no, r, y is negative r times sine theta. So now I can plot those two. I can say f1 dot plot x, y. And this should work. Let's see. Okay, so there, there's that. Now I'm going to make... I want to make it look a little bit nicer. So what I'm going to do is to set the, it starts up here at x equals zero, y equals zero. No, x equals negative three, y equals zero. Uh, but I want to set the uh, the other ends of this graph so that it looks a little bit nicer. Um, let's see. So let's just put up here, I'm going to say um, x max, the maximum x value is zero. So it will automatically put that over there. And then y minimum is negative three. So it will, it will put those parameters in the graph and it won't have to zoom. And I made an error. Y min. Oh, equals. I didn't save this. Block with friction curved path. <clears throat> I'm going to give you the code. Don't worry, I'm going to give you the code. Okay, go down here. Oh, what happened? There it is. That's weird. Okay, so now let's run it. See, doesn't that look nice? Okay, so uh, let's do a couple things. Uh, let's print out the final. If you did this as a problem, the problem may say, what's the final position or what's the final time? So I can say print t equals t in seconds, and then I could print the velocity v equals, I have to calculate that, it's going to be r times theta dot, right, in meters per second. Now there is a small problem here. Uh, one of the problems is that if if the frictional, if the, if the block stops, Okay. If the block, if the friction is too high and the block stops before getting to the end, the friction's still there, right? Because I didn't tell the friction to turn off. I didn't have real friction. I didn't have it switched to to the static friction, and so it would still just keep pushing it back up. So that's kind of weird. But uh, so let's see if I ch let's see what I get down here. So I get six point five five, um, <clears throat> and then I can change the frictional force. Um, you could have more than one. Um, plot. Actually, I did this with two, two graphs, um, but I can change this to, say, 0.4 for the friction, so more friction. And see, it goes down. It's going slower. Hopefully, that's slower. Yeah. So, and it takes longer. Now, also, if this was a problem, they said, okay, it starts at this point right here, where you just have to start with initial conditions of what's my initial theta, what's my initial theta dot, and it still works. Okay, so that is the block sliding down a curved path with friction. Hopefully you find that useful. I am, I'm actually using it for something else. So uh, I'm actually going to do also a block on a downward curving path. So uh, like that with friction. But that will be another video. Okay, that's it.